The Fantastic Beast films expand the Harry Potter universe so much, especially when it comes to the many magical creatures that appear in the movies. I thought it would be fun to go over every single beast we've seen so far in the films and give you guys more details on each one. So I went through both films frame by frame, referenced the screenplay for both movies, and of course referenced Newt Scamander's best-selling book of which the films are named after. And I put together the ultimate video explaining every single beast we've seen so far in the Fantastic Beast films. So get ready to expand your Harry Potter knowledge and let's get this video started. The first creature that makes an appearance is a Niffler, which is described as a burrowing creature that is obsessed with anything glittery or shiny. They are often kept by goblins to find them treasure, and though they're gentle and affectionate creatures, they can be very destructive, and Newt Scamander advised witches and wizards to never keep them in a house. This is not the first time we were introduced to Nifflers, however, as they were introduced in the Goblet of Fire by Hagrid in his Care of Magical Creatures lesson. We also saw a Niffler in the fifth book when Lee Jordan put a few in Umbridge's office. The next creature is an Akami, which we saw hatch in the bank, and later we see a whole nest of them. They are plump, two-legged winged creatures with a serpent-like body. It can reach a length of 15 feet, and it feeds on mostly rats and birds, and occasionally monkeys. It is aggressive to all who approach it, especially in defense of its eggs, whose shells are made of the purest, softest silver. They can grow and shrink to fit the available space, as we saw a dew filling an entire room and then shrinking down to fit in a teapot. After that, we see a bow truckle. They're known as Tree Guardians, and they are immensely difficult to spot, as its max size is 8 inches. They are very shy creatures, but if the tree that they live in is threatened, they have been known to leap down upon the one responsible and gouge their eyes with its long and sharp fingers. This is another creature that made an appearance in the original books first, specifically in the Order of the Phoenix, when the class was told to study and later draw the creatures. The next creature we see is a house elf, which we pretty much all know of. They are creatures that are sworn to one wizarding family, and they act as slaves to that family unless they are given clothes by their masters. We saw plenty of house elves in the original series, from Dobby to Winky to Creature, and of course all of the house elves in the Hogwarts kitchens. The next creature we see is a Mertlap, a rat-like creature with a growth on its back, and if you eat that growth, it can cause resistance to curses and jinxes. A bite from a Mertlap can cause flames out of a person's anus that can last up to 48 hours, and if you're foolish enough to step on the creature, it might eat your foot before you even have time to react. The next creature is a Billywig. It's so fast that it's rarely seen by humans unless they are stung, and once stung, the person suffers from giddiness followed by levitation. Generations of young witches and wizards, mostly in Australia, have attempted to catch billywigs and provoke them to sting them so they can enjoy the side effects. However, too many stings may cause the victim to hover uncontrollably for days on end, and if allergic to the creature and stung, permanent floating could take place. Next we have the Swooping Evil, which is the first beast that we've come across that was made solely for this movie. It's basically an extremely large butterfly, and when it's not flying, it shrinks into a green spiny cocoon. It can be quite dangerous as it feeds on people's brains, and as we saw with Newt, he used the creature as a weapon to escape Makuza. The Thunderbird is the next creature we see, and this was another creature created solely for this movie. It's a close relative to the Phoenix, the creature Fox was, and it has the ability to create storms as it flies. One of the four houses of the American Wizarding School, Ilvermorny, is named after this beast as well. The next creature we see that isn't mentioned but just in the background is a giant dung beetle. It's like a normal dung beetle, but obviously judging by its name, it's much bigger, which is where the magical aspect of the creature comes in. It has three large horns that it could use to push or carry balls of dung, which is exactly what it's doing here behind Jacob. Next, we are introduced to Grap Horns. They are known to have an extremely aggressive nature, and mountain trolls can sometimes be seen riding them. Their outer layer is one of the toughest of any creatures, being even tougher than dragons, meaning it can repel most spells. Newt rescued two of them, and they happen to be the last two breeding pair in existence, meaning that Newt single-handedly saved the creatures from being extinct. As the camera pans away from the Grap Horns, we see a Flooper. They could be orange, pink, lime green, or yellow, and its fur has long been a provider of fancy quills. Though at first enjoyable, Flooper's song will eventually drive the listener to insanity, and because of this, they are sold with a silencing charm on it. Next, we see Doxies, which are often mistaken for fairies, as they have human-like bodies with wings, but their body has two legs and two arms. The Doxies then fly up to Glowbugs, which are magical worm-like creatures that are kept inside light bulbs. As the camera pans over, we see Grindelos, which is no new creature to those that read the Harry Potter books, as there are loads of them in the Great Lake as we saw in the Triwizard Tournament. They're known as water demons, and they're aggressive toward wizards and muggles, though people have been known to domesticate them and have them as pets. 
Anundu is shown next, and to many, it's considered the most dangerous creature alive. The breath of Anundu, which is stored in the inflated sack on their neck, is so toxic and deadly that it could wipe out entire villages of people. Seen right after the Nundu, as the Nundu goes after them, are Durikrawls, bird-like creatures that are known for their remarkable methods of escaping danger. They do this by vanishing and then reappearing somewhere else. Interestingly, Muggles were once fully aware of the existence of the Durikrawl, though they knew it by the name of a Dodo. Unaware that they could vanish at will, Muggles believe that they have hunted the species to extinction. Next are Mooncalves, shy creatures with huge bulging round eyes on top of their head. They only emerge from their burrows at full moon, and they perform complicated dances on their hind legs, often leaving intricate geometric patterns behind in wheat fields to the great puzzlement of muggles. If they drop silvery dung during their dance, the dung can be used to grow flower beds very fast and make them very strong. The next creature we see is a mare mite, which is described as a cross between a dust mite and a squid. Their tentacles can reach up to 10 feet, but they are unable to feed themselves and have to be bottle fed as we saw Newt doing. Probably the most interesting creature that we see in the first film is an Obscurus. This creature is created when a young witcher wizard represses their magical abilities, and a manifestation of that repressed energy forms what we know as an Obscurus. If the Obscurus is inside of a child, the child is known as an Obscurial, and we have seen two examples of these, Credence Barebone and Ariana Dumbledore, Albus Dumbledore's sister. And if what Grindelwald said at the end of the last movie is true, Credence Barebone is also a Dumbledore, though I highly doubt this, I guess we'll see. The next creature we see is the Urumpin. It can weigh up to a ton, has a thick hide that repels most charms and curses, and it has a horn that can pierce everything from skin to metal, and the horn contains deadly fluid that is highly explosive. We of course saw this in the Deathly Hallows when Xenophilius Lovegood had a Urumpin horn in his house, and it basically blew the entire house up. However, in the films it was the Death Eaters that blew it up, but in the book it was the horn, and I'm gonna go by the books. We see goblins next, and they need little explanation. Here we see a different side of goblins, however, and instead of them being uptight and working as we saw at Gringotts, here we see them at a jazz club singing and dancing. In the end, however, the goblins do what they do best and double-cross the wizards. In the jazz club, we also see a giant, another creature that needs no introduction. They can reach up to 20 to 25 feet and can be very dangerous as they are barbaric creatures compared to humans, and they tend not to like witches and wizards who drove them away into the mountains. During the period of this film, however, it appears that they have not yet been shunned by wizards, or they might have just been shunned in Europe, but not in America, which is why this giant is casually in a pub like this in America. In the pub scene, we also see an Ashwinder egg. An Ashwinder can be created in two different ways. One, if a magical fire is allowed to be burned unchecked for too long and it rises from the flames. Or two, if that Ashwinder that came from the flames lays eggs, and they are hatched from the eggs. They're serpent-like creatures with glowing red eyes, and they only live for an hour or two, and in that time, they find dark secluded places to lay their eggs. Their eggs are of great value because they are key ingredients in well-made love potions. After that, we see the demiguys. The beast is able to make itself invisible and can be seen only by wizards skilled in capture, and they also have the ability to tell the future. The demiguys that we see in the film was actually carrying the Akami, showing its peaceful nature as it protected the other creature, a trait that is very common in most demiguys. And for the last creature in the first film, we actually see this one in a deleted scene, and I'm very sad we didn't get to see this in the film because it's one of the most interesting creatures. It's called a Runespore, and it's a three-headed serpent. They were once the favorite pet of dark wizards and parcel mouths who can speak parcel tongue, the language of snakes. Each of their heads serves a different purpose. The left head is the planner, deciding where the Runespore is going and what it's going to do next. The middle head is the dreamer, which it does very often because they sleep for days at a time. And the right head is the critic that will evaluate the efforts of the left and middle heads with a continual and irritable hissing, and its fangs are much more venomous than the other two heads. It's rare for the creature to reach a great age, as the heads tend to attack each other, and it's common to see it with the right head missing, because the other two heads band it together to bite it off. Now moving on to the crimes of Grindelwald, the first creature we see is called a Chupacabra. It's a blood-sucking lizard-like creature with six legs, multiple spines, and several sharp teeth. It was the pet of Grindelwald, but he clearly did not care about the creature. So needy. Next we have Thestrals, which we saw many times in the original series. They can only be seen by those who have witnessed and processed death. They can fly and they have an amazing sense of direction, and they are of course most well known to fans as the creatures that pull the Hogwarts carriages. 
during his escape, we see Grindelwald turn black ropes into black snakes with red eyes, which I believe are just normal human snakes, but I thought I'd add it because technically it was a creature brought to life with magic. We also see Bowtruckles, Nifflers, this time baby Nifflers, and we again see House Elves, but I've already covered all of these creatures, so let's move on. Next we see a Lucrata, a large magical beast that resembles a moose, but with an impossibly huge mouth. We see Doxies again, this one you can barely spot, but it's flying up on the Lucrata. We also see Mooncalves again, very noticeable with their bulging round eyes on top of their head. Again, if you look really closely, you can see what looks like a unique magical badger in the background, which is fitting because the badger is of course the mascot of Hufflepuff's house. Next, we see the Kelpie, which is a water demon that can take various shapes, though it most often appears as a horse. It is very dangerous because if anyone tries to ride it without knowing how to correctly mount it, the Kelpie would take the rider to the bottom of the water's surface and devour them. The biggest Kelpie was found in Loch Ness, Scotland, and muggles call it the Loch Ness Monster, as this specific Kelpie chose to take the form of a giant sea serpent. We then see an augury, which is a very shy creature that stays in its nest unless it's getting food. Their distinctive low and throbbing cry was once believed to foretell death, so wizards avoided these creatures, afraid of hearing their cries, and more than one wizard has heard it and had a heart attack. They eventually realized, however, that their cries merely predicted the approach of rain. In The Cursed Child, which is a pile of crap in my opinion, but I'll add this fact anyway, the character Delphi has augury wings tattooed on the back of her neck as she grew up with an augury in her house. In the background, we see what looks like the eye of an Akami, as we know that they can become huge to fit the available space, though this appears to be underwater, so I'm not sure if they swim. I looked in the screenplay and there was nothing said about this eye, but I'm almost positive it's an Akami. In the circus, we see a number of creatures, starting with the Kappa, a Japanese water demon that feeds on human blood. It can be persuaded not to harm a person, however, if it's thrown a cucumber with that person's name carved into it. It gets all of its strength from the water in the hollow top of its head, so if a wizard tricked them into bowing to them and the water poured out, the Kappa would be deprived of its strength. Next, we see fire drakes, small flying wizards that are often mistaken for dragons, but they do not breathe fire. Instead, they emit sparks from the ends of their tails, which can be used to set anything flammable alight. Looking closely in the background of the circus, you can clearly see an oni, a horned humanoid creature with red or blue skin, and this specific creature was an attraction at the circus. While the Obscurus was the most interesting creature in the first film, I think a Maledictus is probably the most interesting in the second film, because the Maledictus we meet is actually Nagini, Voldemort's snake. A Maledictus is described as a female individual who carries a blood curse that eventually turns her into a beast. At first, they can control the change from human to animal, but over time, they lose control and can't return to their human form. The last circus creature we see is a Zowu, an elephant-sized feline beast. It's a Chinese creature that is incredibly fast, incredibly powerful, and has the ability to travel a thousand miles in a day. I already went over house elves, but here we are introduced to our first ever half house elf, half human named Irma. The details of how she was made, I don't even want to know. We once again see an Obscurus that is housed inside of Credence, but we already went over that, so moving on, we have Streelers. You can see them in one of the jars during the Lita and Newt flashback at Hogwarts. They're giant snails that can change color every hour, and they produce poisonous slime that they leave behind. During this flashback, we also see a raven, which isn't a magical creature, but it's the Lestrange's family emblem, and most definitely not the mascot of Ravenclaw. That's an eagle. It bothers me how many people get that wrong due to the films changing Ravenclaw's mascot from an eagle to a raven, a move that I still think is one of the worst decisions they made for the movies. Again during the flashback, we see a Boggart, a creature that is nothing new for Harry Potter fans, and I'm sure you all know that they are creatures that take the shape of whatever the person in front of them fears most. One of the grosser creatures we see is a water dragon parasite that was stuck in Yusuf's eye. They resemble spindly waterborne spiders, and they are normally in the eyes of water dragons, hence their name, but they can also be in human eyes as we saw with Yusuf. Their powerful venom causes human hosts to lose consciousness, and the human can be passed out for several hours. The Madigo is another creature that was introduced in this film, and they are used by the French Ministry of Magic to handle the security of certain departments. Normally they are harmless, but when provoked, they turn into very ferocious creatures. They can also multiply themselves upon being hit with spells, meaning most magic won't do much to stop them. Also, when they exit the Wizarding World, they transform to ordinary black cats. 
The Protego Diabolica Fire Dragon is one that I hesitated about putting in this video, but ultimately I think it is a beast. When Grindelwald casted Protego Diabolica, it created a ring of fire to protect him. And looking at the screenplay, it says that what Grindelwald unleashed took the form of a dragon-like creature intent on annihilation. And finally, the Phoenix. We know Phoenix as well because of Fox, Dumbledore's Phoenix. Every time it dies, it catches on fire and is reborn from its own ashes. It can disappear and reappear at will, and Phoenix Song, the music that they're able to produce, is magical as it increases the courage of the pure heart and it strikes fear into the hearts of the impure. Their tears also have insane healing properties, even saving Harry from the deadly Basilisk Venom. And that's it, 45 magical creatures, and every creature we've seen so far in the first two Fantastic Beasts films. I'm excited to see what creatures come in the final three movies. Thank you so much for watching, guys. You can follow me on social media to see more of my personal life and see more of this little dude. You can follow me on Twitter and Facebook for Movie Flame updates. And I want to give a huge shout out to all my patrons listed below. If you want to be featured in the next video, plus get a bunch of other rewards, become a patron today. Again, thank you so much for watching. Make sure you press that like button and subscribe, and look out for more great videos on the way.